typically computer hardware or software, that is announced to the general public, but is never actually manufactured nor officially canceled. In our economy, vapor wealth is a net worth that is announced to the general public via the Times and Forbes rich lists, but it, that is also never actually created in the first place. Instead, the wealth was stolen uh, through, for example, LIBOR or Forex market rigging or through high-frequency trading, or it was an illusion conjured up on the Fed's balance sheet, a fictional value derived from stock buybacks financed through highly leveraged loans backed by belly button vapor balloons of derivatives until pop, and then it goes away. Now, let's talk more about this with the incomparable Stacy Herbert. Stacy, <laughs> Max, yes, we live in the days of insta-crashes, flash crashes, and vapor wealth. Here's the headline. China's richest man loses $15 billion in minutes. In the history of sudden wealth loss, Li Hejun may have set a new record. Li, who was China's richest man until this week, saw his fortune drop by as much as $15 billion in half an hour as a stock in his company, Hanergy Thin Film Power Group, fell by nearly half. He was worth $30 billion. Now he's worth $50 billion, they say. Now, this happened last week. But I've been really thinking about it in terms of our global situation that these – that so-called wealth, $15 billion can just evaporate overnight, whether it's in this man's, you know, personal balance sheet or a national balance sheet. Suddenly, everything just, in the case of Greece, these collateral derivatives were hiding all their debt, and suddenly they're, whoop, worth negative something. Right. Well, I mean, there's a number of points here, but the, the, the main point here is that the globe is puffed up with a lot of this, this uh, borrowed money that is supporting very fragile, unstable pockets of wealth. Now, here in, in China on the uh, Hong Kong exchange, where I believe this crash took place, you have several billionaires whose fortunes are tied to a concept of a theoretical presence of money under certain conditions. And when those conditions change, you have, uh, I would say, almost uh, what happens uh, in the physical world when uh, water turns to vapor or water turns to ice. It's only one degree that separates water from being either vapor or ice. It, it enters a phase change. Yes, and regarding this guy's particular loss of $15 billion, half his wealth in a few minutes, um, they said prior to the drop, the company's shares had risen by more than fivefold since September, baffling analysts. Reuters reports that Hong Kong regulators are looking at alleged market manipulation with the stock. But, you know, just in a recent episode of Kai's report, we were talking about the fivefold increase in the, in the price of medallions, of taxi medallions, the same sort of thing, unusual activity, uh, the 37 percent increase in the price of properties in San Francisco. All of these are like confounding analysts as wealth, as incomes drop by 10% over the same period, you know, all these bubbles are popping up everywhere. So I posit that possibly we're going to see the same thing. It's just going to evaporate overnight. We're going to have a, you know, you're going to wake up one morning and all the markets across the world have crashed. 50, 60, 70% of all our wealth disappears. And it was all vaporware, vapor wealth. Sublimation. I think that's the phrase used to describe this phase change. But you have to understand, Stacey, that since the crash of 2008, the global debt has gone from $140 trillion to $200 trillion. So these pockets of illusory wealth are simply debt that's being parked onto the balance sheets of folks who then will use part of that money to go out and buy a Picasso for $100 million, let's say. But when you have a phase change, and in the old days, in biblical days, there used to be the debt jubilees every seven years or so, where the rulers would simply say, we've got too much debt, we're going to cancel all the debt and take our lumps and start again. But in this economy, because the plutocrats own the corpocracy and the governments, the governments are not performing as they should, the function needed to clear the economy of the dead wood. So instead, we're going to have the market itself will introduce, like the Larson B ice shelf in Antarctica, which is about to slide into the ocean and raise global ocean levels, will have an enormous debt collapse, like Japan did in 1989, collapse 40, 50, 60, 70 percent, which will set off an enormous 
confiscation of wealth through the need to retire all of this worthless debt, and, and it'll happen from the outside forces. And our leaders will claim they never saw it coming and they have no responsibility, and yet that's, that's the claim of a coward, Cameron, or whoever's running America at that point. So we have all of this trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of derivatives, which is part of the vapor wealth effect that we have. We have, remember, all these sort of scandals of horse meat being sold as beef or, you know, prime beef and things like that. So we have a whole fabric of our society and our economy is vapor. Um, now, also, when we see these property bubbles in Vancouver, New York, London, everybody says, well, how is this possible? You know, is there an endless supply of money coming from China? Because a lot of it is driven by China. And there's another story the same week, last week, as this guy lost $15 billion on his um, solar panel company. Well, a guy in Hong Kong in a similar wealth decline, Hong Kong property and electronics magnate Pan Sutong has lost more than $11 billion as shares of two listed companies, Golden Financial and Golden Property, both closed down more than 40%. I think they closed down at 60% at one point. They went down 60%. So he had been worth $28 billion. Now I guess he's worth like $17 billion. But again, like how much, how much is that, of that is going to reverberate if that was vapor? You know, how much of this is vapor right behind us? All these uh, luxury properties going up here, which I think the one bedroom is the cheapest place in there is like one and a half million pounds right. for a tiny two second floor flat. But is, is this Chinese fellow too big to fail? Will he be bailed out? This is the issue. This is the problem is that the theory going back to 2008 was if we engage in Keynesian thinking and allow the central banks to expand their debt by $60 trillion, that will create escape velocity. That is to say, we'll create GDP growth sufficient to start paying mm -hmm. down the debt. But instead, uh, we've created um, more debt and debt, for example, in, in the UK, for example, the UK pays more than a billion pounds a, a, a week to pay off their debt. Yeah, but it's all vapor. I'm saying we, we have vapor wealth. If, it, if these guys who are right now the source of the latest bubble around the world, is a lot of it is coming from China and Hong Kong, if their wealth is evaporating, overnight by 50, 60, 70 percent, then surely it's going to trickle down over here. And by the way, trickle, speaking of trickle down, I realize that this is part of the problem of this whole trickle down theory is that it's all vapor wealth and vapor, of course, rises. But I, I, I would call this a form of financial narcosis in that, you know, on, on Mount Everest recently, the people who experienced the avalanche there, before they experienced this avalanche, they were running out of oxygen and they gave them a lightheadedness. And so there you are having, you know, a certain variation of narcosis in the highest peak of the world, having delusions about you running the world. And then that snowflake hits and the avalanche occurs. And now you're down at base camp one uh, underneath several miles of snow, dead. Same thing with the debt pushers, whether it's Mark Carney or Janet Yellen. They are getting high on their own vapors on mm. their own debt creation, saying mm. we're incredibly ingenious. We've created $200 trillion worth of debt, and all we did was put m hundreds of millions of people in hot poverty and give this jack mule in uh, the Mideast somewhere the money to go buy a Picasso for $100 million. We're so smart. And then that, whoo, that last little bit hits the unstable system, and you have a debt apocalypse. And that, but but the, the, the crime here is that all the politicians will claim they never saw it coming. They had no idea what was going to happen. And that, to me, is a hanging offense. So this guy, Pan Sutong, his shares in the two companies that collapsed, they had risen by 300% in 2015 alone. And regarding that rise, an uh, analyst uh, at uh, Core Pacific Yamichi in Hong Kong says, valuations are ridiculously high. The stock surged too much, and no one knows why. But now look at that same thing. 300% increase in the price in um, his shares in 2015. Well, if you cut to this headline, number of New York City apartments for rent above $50,000 per month triples since 2008, and 82% of U.S. construction is now luxury units. So this is from Liberty Blitzkrieg, and he looks at two articles, one from Bloomberg and one from Wall Street Journal, and they say the hot market for super luxury apartments has spurred new high-end projects. Spending on residential construction increased 73% in 2014 from the year before, according to the New York Building Congress, but the n number of new units increased by only 11%. That means fewer resources for more affordable housing, the existence of, of pricey buildings, implies that the lower end isn't growing as quickly. So, again, we have the same sort of 
um, you know, blow off tops coming right. all around and, the, everywhere you look. And keep in mind that the tax income, tax revenues from labor and from capital expense and from, from uh, uh, export is dropping around the world as part of a global deflationary collapse. Uh, on a net basis, you could say, well, taxes are up because you're paying taxes on the capital gains from all this ether trading. But once the ether is removed, then you have to go back to the reality that over the past 10 to 15 years, tax revenues from pr production, from productive work, from labor, mm -hmm. is nosediving. So how, but you're still left with 200 trillion or more in debt. So there's going to be a currency reset around the world. Against what? Well, you can't reset the global currency against fiat currency that got you into this mess to begin with. This is why Russia just announced that they bought another 500,000 ounces of gold last month. And then the Economist magazine says, oh, Russia is, is stupid for buying all that gold. Well, you know, it's the old biblical saying, he with the gold makes the rules. And so back to the story from Liberty Bricks Krieg about the luxury development of property based on this vapor wealth is of 370,000 multifamily rental units completed from 2012 to 2014 in 54 U.S. metropolitan areas, 82 percent were in the luxury category. In some places, including Denver, Tampa, Baltimore and Phoenix, virtually all new apartment construction has been targeted to high end renters In Atlanta, about 95 percent of new apartments have been in the luxury category. Well, look, the price of gold is up 500 percent since it was bottom at 250. But during that time, the global indebtedness has increased by 25 fold. So the price of gold at 12 to 13 dollars an ounce has never been cheaper in the history relative to the amount of phony fiat money in the system. Gold is actually trading for probably two dollars an ounce in 1980 dollars. All right, Stacey, thanks so much. So once this vapor evaporates, you're going to have a lot of luxury apartments for free over in Atlanta, Denver, and elsewhere. Oh, well, the homeless people will be happy about that. All right, well, stay tuned for the second half. A whole lot more. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser, team. <clears throat> Time now to turn to Liam Halligan. He's a columnist for The Telegraph. An editor at large for BNE.eu. Liam, welcome back to the Cosmic Report. Max, nice to see you. All right, now I want to talk, talk to me about something you're excited about. You're writing about South to South trade. What is it? Tell, tell me. Yeah, in, my, in, in Business New Europe, um, BNE.eu, I write a, an invisible hand column every month. It's called The Invisible Hand. And the one that I've just written is about South South trade. I was at the EBRD annual summit in Tbilisi last week, and this was a, there was a big sense going on there that as well as investment from Western countries into Eastern Europe and the transition economies, there's an awful lot of investment coming in, not just from the Chinese, but the Indians too. One of the biggest inv foreign investors in Georgia, by the way, is Tata of India. They're involved in a huge hydro project. So I've been writing in BNE about South-South trade. So the countries involved are? It, it's emerging market to emerging market trade. Brick, brick, what are the name? Countries. Yeah, it's, it's the fact that Brazil's biggest trading partner now is China. There's massive trade links from $20 billion to $100 billion a Russia's year. Russia's in there. From Russia to China. You've got big trade links emerging between uh, India and Brazil. It's up to 30%. It's 30% of all global trade now, up from just 10% of global trade just 10 years ago. It's on global UN numbers. south. It's south-to-south -south trade, and it, what it does, there are two things, Max. The first thing, it means that the multilateral architecture has to change. We're meaning? Si we're seeing meaning that what? Multilevel architecture. Things like what? the World Bank and the IMF, which tend to be from you know, Western countries looking down on Eastern countries. You now need Eastern countries, as it were, running the big multilaterals. We're seeing that with the Chinese launching the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure uh, in uh, Investment Bank, which, of course, has caused a huge uh, diplomatic row. It also also means, Max, that even if the Western world is slowing down, the emerging markets can still grow, nourished by their trade from each other. So we just look at financial markets and we see the emerging markets having difficulties because it's all a QE, you know, liquidity tsunami and everybody's just worried about what Janet Yellen uh, says. But actually, there's still pretty good growth in the emerging markets. They're still going to grow on average by 4 or 5% a year. Yes, China's going to go from 8 or 9% to 6 or 7% this year, but India's going to do pretty well. And the UK so, joined this new bank. 
the UK did join the new... What's the acronym again? AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. So it's a it's compete with... It's uh, Chinese-led. It's Chinese-led. For some time, America was trying to stop particularly Western countries from joining, arm-twisting, uh, and Asian countries as well. Uh, George Osborne actually grew a pair a few months ago and said, actually, America, we are going to join the AIIB as founder members. France, then Germany, then Italy did the same. And just a couple of weeks ago, Madeleine Albright, former Secretary of State, of course, she said that America's attempts to stop other countries joining AIIB because it's China-led were, quotes, a screw-up. Okay, let me ask you about uh, Greece, because Greece is a country that is being courted by the BRICS, principally Russia, and they are also Christian Orthodox. You know, they'll fit right, right in there with the Greeks. And, of course, Russia uh, and then Europe is dominated by Bundesbank and IMF and EU, the Troika. So uh, it w would it make sense for Greece to join the BRICS? I don't think... Greece would necessarily join the BRICS, but we, I've been writing for several months, actually, about the role of Russia in this ongoing standoff between Greece and its West European creditors, if you like. One of the first diplomatic calls, uh, visits that Syriza made after winning the Greek election so spectacularly was to Moscow. Uh, the, uh, Syriza's main coalition partner, their leader, is on record as saying that he wants Greece to leave NATO, uh, which pleases the Russians. And he is now Greece's defence minister. Also, you've got, in the, uh, towards the end of June, Max, there's going to be a big big uh, debate about whether or not the EU should renew its sanctions against Russia. In the States, of course, Congress has to properly act to remove sanctions in the EU. They just have to be renewed. Are they having uh, any impact? Uh, because I noticed initially uh, otherwise, the ruble collapsed and there was some trade uh, stalling, but now the ruble is back to where it was before. Trade is growing south to south. Are the sanctions even doing anything? I think the sanctions are important. Um, uh, the rubles, you know, it's, it's just dipped um, a, a bit. It's back below, if you like, uh, 50 to the dollar. But before sanctions started, it was about 35. So there's a way, a way to go, as, 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 as Russian savers uh, know well. But Greece has a very important role to play because in order to renew EU sanctions against Russia, there has to be a unanimous decision. And Greece has already said, we don't necessarily want to renew sanctions against Russia because, of course, they're trying to play that card to attract uh, credits from Russia as leave against the ECB and Germany and the IMF and all the rest of it. Okay, so the way to look at the entire Russia, EU, America con conflagration is because <laughs> there's a pipeline making its way from Russia to Europe. But it, does, it couldn't go through Ukraine because Victoria Nuland, Assistant Secretary of the State Department in America, staged a coup and they have some puppet in there. So now the pipeline's finding some new, uh, new way around, and it uh, could be Greece. I mean, obviously Greece could be the way to do it. So it's trying to get to Europe. It, it, you know, it's being blocked because America, the pro-competition country, the, you know, the, God forbid someone's competing in the energy market, uh, not, not the Koch brothers owned. But uh, so where's this pipeline going? How's it going to get to Europe? Well, it's still all to play for, but let's not forget, Max, that the Russia already has North Stream, which goes across the floor of the Baltic Sea, directly from Russia to Germany. It's a bilateral uh, pipeline, uh, energy pipeline. And Germany is, how much percentage energy from Russia? It's like 35%. It, it, it's about 40%. 40%. Of, it's about 40% of, 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 all, of all energy. And let's not also forget, this hasn't been really written about much in the Western media anyway, that as well as pipelines to the West, which is where Russia's energy export infrastructure tradition points, you've now got something called ESPO, East Siberia Pacific Ocean. That's an oil pipeline from China to Russia. That exists. It's pumping oil now. A lot of that oil is actually priced not in dollars but in yuan. From China to Russia? From China to Russia. What's China's Russia. Uh, oil business like? Well, they've, they've, China is now the world's second biggest uh, oil importer, and it will soon be the world's biggest oil importer after the U.S. It won't be too many years. And as well as the oil... Oh, okay, so it's China, China and Russia, but Russia's pumping energy to China. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Well, I, and, I, I and got confused there. Since, it's, since, it's Russia to China, not right. China to Russia. It's Russia That's to right. China. It's Russia to China. That's right. Russia is sending energy to China. It's like China it's, needs the energy. It's a huge economic synergy, of course. And since sanctions, um, uh, the Chinese have made a very big show of tightening those energy links with Russia in order to say to the West, uh, we don't believe in isolating Russia. We believe in trading with Russia. So Russia's done uh, big 
uh, gas deals uh, between uh, Rosneft and the Chinese government to secure gas supplies uh, for the next 10 to 15 years. And Russia's also done an energy deal, by the way, with the Indians since sanctions were imposed by America and the EU. And these are big examples of the kind of south-south trade trend that I've been talking about and I've just written about in uh, BNE.EU. BNE.EU. Now, uh, st stay on the Russia theme for a second. So, um, we had um, this whole Russia bashing going on uh, post um, the, um, the, the troubles in Ukraine. Uh, and, we, and we have a lot of um, smearing in the, in the Western media. And we've been on the show and we've been talking about it. But it seems that uh, with this uh, four-hour meeting between John Kerry and Lavrov in Sochi, uh, that's come off the burner. And in fact, there's been a diplomatic kind of uh, solutions. And Russia and Germany apparently worked out a deal over Ukraine to stop hostilities. And uh, it seems like, in this country anyway, the tabloids now are, are pivoting away from Russia bashing to Scotland bashing. <laughs> so Nicola, Nicola Sturgeon is the new Putin. <laughs> Because she's the biggest existential Watch yourself, threat. Watch she hears you say that. Well, according to the tabloids. I'm just saying. The, I see what's coming out of the propaganda of the I, I, BBC and the David Cameron's office. They're, they're, they're slamming, they're smearing Nicola Sturgeon. They're smearing Scotland because they want to get out of the EU, or a lot of people do. But, of course, the idea of Scotland getting out of the UK, that's somehow tyranny and treasonous, even though they want to get out of the EU. So it's complete double standards, it's complete duplicity. It's a complete, uh, you know, r validation that Tories are working only for the plutocrats. But uh, have you noticed that uh, Sturgeon is now the new existential threat in this country and it's no more Putin bashing? OK, I agree with you. The tone of the Western press towards Russia has changed. That's partly uh, because um, the ceasefire in East Ukraine, while of course still very, very patchy, uh, is holding to some degree. We've absolutely got to do some kind of deal before Ukraine defaults. We can't deal with the Eurozone so weak with a, a sovereign default on the fringes uh, of Europe. So there does need to see... Some be, need to be some kind of coming together, some kind of rapprochement, and the Western media is now reflecting that, at least to a degree. When it comes to Scotland, um, I actually think that there is a real head of steam in England, actually, uh, against the idea of Scottish uh, independence, or at least against the idea of where we currently are. Because after our general election, Max, you had the Scottish nationalists who only got a relatively small percent of the vote, less than 5%, and they got 58 of the 650 seats in Parliament, whereas you had UKIP, which got 13% of the vote and just got one seat. So there is a sense that the Scots Nats are overrepresented in the UK Parliament, even though Scotland itself voted for the SNP. Yeah, 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 but Liam... Um, so it's a very uh, difficult uh, constitutional oh, situation. Oh, 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 oh. You, you can't now say that uh, we need to revisit the rules uh, because we didn't like the way uh, the, Scot the Scots were able to play by the rules. Um, you know, if, if the Tories wanted to uh, reintroduce electoral reform, yeah. they could have been doing so for the last two yeah. decades, no, three absolutely. decades, four decades. But absolutely. they benefited magnificently from this gerrymandering and this ability to rig the system and cook the books. Of course, they're Tories. So the fact that Scotland, playing by the rules, sure. ends up with a huge presence sure. in the House of Commons doesn't mean that needs now to be reformed unless you want to say, let's make Scotland... Uh, completely independent, uh, and we'll have them just let them do what they want to do. And then the English people, left over, because the Welsh people will get out of this nightmare as well, they can go ahead and reform. But let Scotland be independent. The problem we have, Max, is that you now have Scottish MPs in the Parliament at Westminster who can vote on English issues, but you have English MPs who can't vote on Scottish issues because Scotland's already got a devolved system uh, of education, of course, and some other uh, government, government functions. Yeah, but the English Parliament is completely irresponsible. They had two million people in the streets protesting the Iraq war. They went to the Iraq war anyway. They don't represent sure, the many, people. Um, They're um, not representational many, government. They need to be all cleaned out. Many, the Scottish people show up and just get rid of them. Great, because <laughs> they deserve to be gotten rid of. And many Scottish MPs ro voted wrongly, in my view, in order for uh, to Britain to go to war in, in Iraq. Look, They're not being responsive. There, there, there is, there's a, there's a, let's, let this, let's talk about the banking scandals. We're 
can he stay over for another segment, by the way? Sure, sure, and then we'll sure. talk about... Just to I mean, say, just when you say say decapitate Scotland, a bag of turn to rules, is it a property, is it a or a sword? 55% of Scottish people said that they didn't want Scotland to leave the Union. That was meant to be a referendum for a generation. Hold on, we got to go. And now the Scots Nats want another referendum. Hold on. Okay, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Liam Halligan. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us. At Kaiser Report. But I've been really thinking about it in terms of our global situation that these that so-called wealth, $15 billion, can just evaporate overnight, whether it's in this man's, you know, personal balance sheet or a national balance sheet. Suddenly, everything just, in the case of Greece, these collateral derivatives were hiding all their debt, and suddenly they're, whoop, worth the negative something. Right. Well, I mean, there's a number of points here, but the, the, the main point here is that the globe is puffed up with a lot of this, this uh, borrowed money that is supporting very fragile, unstable pockets of wealth. Now, here in, in China on the uh, Hong Kong exchange, where I believe this crash took place, you have several billionaires whose fortunes are tied to a concept of a theoretical presence of money under certain conditions. And when those conditions change, you have, uh, I would say, almost uh, what happens uh, in the physical world when uh, water turns to vapor or water turns to ice. It's only one degree that separates water from being either vapor or ice. It, it enters a phase change. Yes, and regarding this guy's particular loss of $15 billion, half his wealth in a few minutes. Um, they said prior to the drop, the company's shares had risen. How is this possible? You know, is there an endless supply of money coming from China? Because a lot of it is driven by China. And there's another story the same week, last week, as this guy lost $15 billion on his um, solar panel company. Well, a guy in Hong Kong in a similar wealth decline, Hong Kong property and electronics magnate Pan Sutong has lost more than $11 billion as shares of two listed companies, Golden Financial and Golden Property, both closed down more than 40%. I think they closed down at 60% at one point. They went down 60%. So he had been worth $28 billion. Now I guess he's worth like $17 billion. But again, like how much, how much is that, of that is going to reverberate if that was vapor? You know, how much of this is vapor right behind us? All these uh, luxury properties going up here, which I think the one bedroom is the cheapest place in there is like one and a half million pounds right. for a tiny two second floor flat. But is, is this Chinese fellow too big to fail? Will he be bailed out? This is the issue. This is the problem is that the theory going back to 2008 was if we engage in Keynesian thinking and allow the central banks to expand their debt by $60 trillion, that will create escape velocity. That is to say, we'll create GDP growth sufficient to start paying mm. down the debt. But instead, uh, we've created um, more debt and debt. For example, in, in the UK, for example, the UK pays more than a billion pounds a, a, a week, Jubilees, every seven years or so, where the rulers would simply say, we've got too much debt, we're going to cancel all the debt and take our lumps and start again. But in this economy, because the plutocrats own the corpocracy and the governments, the governments are not performing as they should, the function needed to clear the economy of the dead wood. So instead, we're going to have the market itself will introduce, like the Larson B ice shelf in Antarctica, which is about to slide into the ocean and raise global ocean levels, will have an enormous debt collapse, like Japan did in 1989, collapse 40, 50, 60, 70 percent, which will set off an enormous confiscation of wealth through the need to retire all of this worthless debt, and, and it'll happen from the outside forces. And our leaders will claim they never saw it coming and they have no responsibility, and yet that's, that's the claim of a coward, Cameron, or whoever's running America at that point. So we have all of this trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of derivatives, which is part of the vapor wealth effect that we have. We have, remember, all these sort of scandals of horse meat being sold as beef or, you know, prime beef and things like that. So we have a whole fabric of our society and our economy is vapor. Um, now, 
also when we see these property bubbles in Vancouver, New York, London, everybody says uh, by more than fivefold since September, baffling analysts. Reuters reports that Hong Kong regulators are looking at alleged market manipulation with the stock. But you know, just in a recent episode of Kaiser Report, we were talking about the fivefold increase in the in the price of medallions, of taxi medallions. The same sort of thing, unusual activity. Uh, the 37 percent increase in the price of properties in San Francisco. All of these are like confounding analysts as wealth as incomes drop by 10 percent over the same period you know all these bubbles are popping up everywhere so i posit that possibly we're going to see the same thing it's just going to evaporate overnight we're going to have a you know you're going to wake up one morning and all the markets across the world have crashed 50 60 70 percent of all our wealth disappears and it was all vaporware with vapor wealth sublimation i think that's the phrase used to describe this phase change but you have to understand, Stacey, that since the crash of 2008, the global debt has gone from $140 trillion to $200 trillion. So these pockets of illusory wealth are simply debt that's being parked onto the balance sheets of folks who then will use part of that money to go out and buy a Picasso for $100 million, let's say. But when you have a phase change, and in the old days, in biblical days, there used to be the de typically computer hardware or software that is announced to the general public, but is never actually manufactured nor officially canceled. In our economy, vapor wealth is a net worth that is announced to the general public via the Times and Forbes rich lists, but it, that is also never actually created in the first place. Instead, the wealth was stolen uh, through, for example, LIBOR or Forex market rigging or through high-frequency trading, or it was an illusion conjured up on the Fed's balance sheet, a fictional value derived from stock buybacks financed through highly leveraged loans backed by belly button vapor balloons of derivatives until pop, and then it goes away. Now, let's talk more about this with the incomparable Stacy Herbert. Stacy, <laughs> Max, yes, we live in the days of insta crashes, flash crashes, and vapor wealth. Here's the headline. China's richest man loses $15 billion in minutes. In the history of sudden wealth loss, Li Hejun may have set a new record. Li, who was China's richest man until this week, saw his fortune drop by as much as $15 billion in half an hour as a stock in his company, Hanergy Thin Film Power Group, fell by nearly half. He was worth $30 billion. Now he's worth $50 billion.